On today's episode, NASA abandons a critical moon landing at the 11th hour, while progress rolls on for the crewed Artemis program. Plus, we get final details on the SpaceX ISS Destruction Dragon. NASA's grand ambitions for exploration of the moon continue to slowly dwindle, as a key scientific rover mission is taken to the chopping block. The Viper Lunar Rover mission, designed to explore the moon's south pole, has been cancelled due to rising costs and delays, causing shock and frustration in the space community. This is made particularly worse by the fact that we know the rover is built and was being prepped for launch. To make matters even stranger, we also now find out that they still intend to ship a cement block to the moon instead of their already completed rover. Can we make this make sense? Short for Volatiles Investigating Polar Exploration Rover, the mission aimed to search for water ice at the moon's south pole. It would use the Griffin Landing Vehicle from American private company Astrobotic to deliver the rover on the lunar surface. In theory, this would be a major stepping stone towards the Artemis program and long-term settlement of the moon. We want to know what we're working with up there before we start sending people, so we send robots first. Basically the exact same thing that China is already doing right now and succeeding at, while the US is just struggling to even get off the ground. The simple answer for all this would be money. But there is a bigger story here beneath the surface that we'll dig into. The key driver for this project cancellation was a budget cost overrun. NASA has a stipulation in their operating procedure that if a project ever goes more than 30% over budget, it triggers a mandatory termination review. Now, this is just a review. It doesn't necessarily mean that the project is automatically dead on arrival. The initial cost for Project Viper was $250 million when the plan was first made in 2019, with a target launch date of 2022. Obviously, some stuff happened in 2020 and 2021 that threw a pretty big wrench into everybody's plans, so it's not surprising that Viper was reassessed at an increased cost of $433 million with a launch date of 2023. This was approved by Congress, so no big deal there. The real problem seems to begin with Viper's landing vehicle. Since NASA hasn't made a proper lunar lander since the 1970s, they need a platform that could deliver their rover safely to the moon. This is where Astrobotics come in with their Griffin lander. This is under another NASA program called Commercial Lunar Payload Service, or CLPS, a series of public-private partnerships that would help to fill in the hardware gaps and enable NASA to focus on scientific exploration of the moon while passing off the launch architecture to commercial aerospace companies. These commercial collaborations have worked out incredibly well in a few circumstances, pretty much anything involving SpaceX, for example, and Rocket Lab has proven to be a strong asset as well. But in most cases, the private sector has not lived up to expectations. The Griffin lander from Pittsburgh-based Astrobotics appears to be a pretty sweet machine on paper. It's supposed to deliver payloads to a variety of lunar orbits and landing sites at pretty much any latitude and longitude on the lunar surface. Near side, far side, polar region, it's all good. Griffin is short and stout with a wide platform that can deliver 625 kilograms of payload to the lunar surface. Compared to the landing platforms we've seen recently from Blue Origin and SpaceX, Griffin is beautifully simple and straightforward. The same can be said for Astrobotic's Peregrine Lander, which is essentially just a smaller version of Griffin. They share the same guidance and propulsion systems. Peregrine was launched for the first time on the maiden voyage of the ULA Vulcan Centaur rocket in January 2024. It was carrying a total of 20 payloads from 7 nations and 16 commercial customers. Shortly after launch, Peregrine suffered a propulsion issue, short-circuiting its multi-engine burn and failing to achieve a translunar injection. The spacecraft was still functional enough to be directed back towards the Earth, and it burned up over the Pacific Ocean. So, no Knowing that, it's actually a good thing that Astrobotics chose to delay the launch of the Griffin in favor of more time for pre-flight testing. The timeline shifted from 2023 to 2024. This was clarified last week by NASA's Deputy Associate Administrator for Exploration within the Science Mission Directorate, Joel Kearns. He said, 
We had already made the decision to reschedule landing for 2024 so that we could have Astrobotic do additional propulsion tests on the lander. So, to me, this already sounds like NASA throwing Astrobotic firmly underneath the bus. Kearns went on, quote, When we made that decision, we updated the Viper work plan and we reset the budget to $505 million, with a landing at the end of 2024. But our latest estimate that was done earlier this year showed that since we are no longer planning to land Viper at the end of 2024, but instead would have to wait for the science window in 2025, that the cost for the Viper project was projected to be $609 million. That new figure is what triggered a mandatory termination review under NASA's budgetary regulations. According to an update from May 2024, NASA shared that the Viper rover was already complete and had passed its system readiness review, allowing the vehicle to move on to its final testing. NASA uses a shaker table, acoustic bombardment, and a thermal vacuum chamber to certify their hardware can survive the forces of a rocket launch and spaceflight. This has been standard procedure for several decades. During his comments on Wednesday, Kern said that at this point, Viper hadn't completed system level environmental tests and that some ground systems needed to operate the rover on the moon weren't complete either. So NASA doesn't have a fully functional rover, but they are pretty damn close. So close that it seems absolutely insane to just give up right now. Kern says that NASA will save at least $84 million by canceling Viper, which doesn't sound like much, but we have to go one step deeper here. Kern stressed that even a landing in 2025 is not guaranteed, and that it could easily be pushed back to 2026, adding yet another 200 or so million dollars to the price tag. Viper is a complicated mission in that it has to land during the summer season on the moon's south pole. That gives NASA a launch window of September to November, and from what I can gather, NASA did not have a high degree of confidence that Griffin would be able to hit that timeline. Viper was crucial for NASA's lunar exploration strategy, aiming to map water, ice, and other resources vital for future manned missions under the Artemis program. The rover's scientific payload included instruments like a neutron spectrometer system, near-infrared volatile spectrometer, and regolith and ice drill for exploring new terrain which would have provided unprecedented insights into the moon's resources, informing the development of lunar habitats and the sustainability of a long-term human presence on the moon. Despite the cancellation though, NASA has plans to repurpose Viper's instruments for other missions. They also intend to go forward with the Griffin landing, which will now be used as a technology demonstrator, testing its capacity to land large payloads on the lunar surface. NASA has already invested $323 million of sunk cost into Astrobotics to get this vehicle developed. Now it's on the private company to finish the job. So Griffin is still intended to fly to the moon, at some point in the future, and instead of carrying a rover, it will haul a dummy payload with an equivalent weight to the 430 kilogram Viper. I've heard Elon Musk say before that dummy payloads are typically just cement blocks, so NASA has already spent somewhere over half a billion dollars to land a literal brick on the moon. The agency is also considering proposals from American companies and international partners to deploy Viper independently, providing us with a little bit of hope that the rover might still reach the lunar surface under different conditions. Hi there. Thanks for watching the show today. I just wanted to quickly drop in here and let you all know about our brand new Space Race newsletter. It goes out every Tuesday morning, Eastern Standard Time. It's prepared for you by our new friend Juan, and it's absolutely chock full of all of the Space Race news and information that you need, from launches to landings to new vehicles and all the drama in between. So check it out in the description below. We have a link for you to sign up. Thank you very much for your time, and back to the news. Here's some promising news for you. NASA has just rolled out the second core stage for the Space Launch System rocket, ready to ship it to Florida for the Artemis II mission next year. Built at the Michoud Assembly Facility in New Orleans, the big orange rocket will be transported to the Kennedy Space Center on a barge named Pegasus. This is the powerhouse of the SLS, containing the main engines and hydrogen propellant tanks, providing the necessary thrust to carry heavy payloads beyond low Earth orbit. 
The journey of this second core stage marks a significant step forward in the Artemis program, which aims to return humans to the moon and eventually Mars. The core stage will undergo additional outfitting at the Kennedy Space Center before being fitted with its two solid rocket boosters and the Orion spacecraft for the Artemis II mission. This mission is currently scheduled for launch no earlier than September 2025. Dave Butcher, SLS program manager at Boeing, the primary contractor for the vehicle, mentioned that the assembly of this second core stage was smoother compared to the first one. This improvement is due to several lessons learned during the initial build. Boeing has fully implemented lean manufacturing techniques which aim to optimize production and reduce waste. For example, they've eliminated duplicate testing and streamlined work processes, especially in their clean rooms. One significant lesson learned is the advantage of doing as much work as possible in the vertical position, providing better access to all parts of the stage. This method minimizes the need for repositioning, saving time and effort. Moreover, ensuring that parts arrive in the correct sequence has addressed previous supply chain challenges, making the assembly process more efficient. Although numerous lessons have been learned and recent progress has been made, Boeing's role in the SLS program hasn't been without its controversies. The project has faced extensive delays and massive cost overruns, with some critics arguing that it represents corporate welfare and political maneuvering rather than engineering and scientific advancement. Nevertheless, the successful launch of SLS on Artemis 1 and progress with the second stage are critical milestones for the moon landing program. The delivery of this second core stage to the Kennedy Space Center signifies a shift from manufacturing to launch readiness. As easy as it is to be cynical about Boeing and NASA and governments, this mission to send people back to the moon in our generation is something that deserves all of the positive energy that we can muster. When we found out that NASA had contracted SpaceX to develop a new spacecraft specifically for the purpose of deorbiting the International Space Station, we had all just kind of assumed that it would be some roided up version of a Dragon spacecraft. And now we have confirmation that this is exactly what SpaceX has in mind. The dedicated destruction variant of Dragon will have an extended trunk section that increases propellant capacity by six times and ups the power output by four times. From the limited renderings we've been shown, there will be a high concentration of hypergolic Draco thrusters in the aft section of the new module. These will be dedicated to knocking the ISS out of its orbit and pushing it down into Earth's atmosphere. It looks like the Destruction Dragon will be docked to the Japanese Kaibo module when it does the deed. NASA, which will own and operate the USDV after SpaceX builds it, will launch the vehicle to the ISS shortly after the arrival of the station's final crew. Once the USDV arrives and is checked out, ISS controllers will allow the station's orbit to naturally decay, with the final crew leaving once the station's altitude, which is currently 400 kilometers, reaches down to just 330 kilometers. The station's orbit will decay further for about six months before NASA uses the USDV for a final controlled deorbit of the station, targeting an open area of ocean in a narrow corridor about 2,000 kilometers long. NASA expects pieces of the station ranging in size from a microwave oven to a sedan to survive re-entry and splash down into that corridor. With an estimated mass of 30 metric tons, it's still unknown what rocket will deploy the deorbit vehicle. It's too much mass for the Dragon's traditional Falcon 9 carrier, it's also too heavy for the new Vulcan Centaur rocket, although a triple booster Falcon Heavy could handle the job without breaking a sweat, so it's hard to imagine any other candidate. 